All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is a joy, a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Uh, my name is Yeral Osurto, and I serve as the Director of Religious and Spiritual Life at Ithaca College and as the Executive Director for Student Equity and Belonging. Um, it is my great honor to be surrounded by such a great group of people, both panelists and guests that are joining us from all over the country. Um, just briefly in terms of why we're here tonight, um, a few semesters ago, so two semesters ago, um, we were thinking about how do we create opportunities for people to explore those defining moments. And we found that sort of the regular small group conversations were great, but it was, there was a gap. We didn't have models, our students didn't have models of people that were doing this work through mediums such as podcasts. And so out of this idea, we developed this podcast host series and podcast creator series and invited podcast creators to have that conversation with us, right? Of how do podcasts lift up stories of intersecting identity, of defining moments in our lives, of relationship with faith and spirituality and activism. And so tonight we have Misha Yusuf joining us in conversation. Um, and we're really, really thrilled to have her with us. And for those on Facebook Live, welcome as well. Um, if you have questions at any point, you can enter them in the comments and we'll be making sure to keep track of those during the question and answer um, time. I also just wanna give a, a big, huge thanks to um, Raza, my colleague at Ithaca College, who serves as a director for the Park Center for Independent Media, and my colleague at Cornell, Yassine, um, who is the chaplain at uh, Cornell University and the director of Muslim, the Muslim Life Program there. So I'll pass it on to Yassine to give a, a quick welcome and words from his side of Ithaca, New York. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, again, I'm the chaplain Yasin Ahmed, and I serve as the director of Muslim Life at Cornell, where we develop, where we are developing a prophetic community, trying to establish meaningful relationships with all community members. The goal of which is to empower individuals while establishing a community of wellness. We're so 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 excited to host Misha and welcome her to our community because of her commitment to understanding all differences while highlighting marginalized voices and reminding us faith is one heck of a journey. Misha, welcome to our community. For the rest of you, I hope you all have an enjoy, you all enjoy this enlightening discussion. Without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator for the, for the night, Raza Rumi. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, we are really excited to have Misha here and I'm really grateful for my colleague uh, Errol to have organized this and of course Yasin Yu at Cornell and it's a it's a great evening I wish uh, we could uh, be meeting in person but anyway this is the best of the options that we have my name is Raza Rumi as uh, was mentioned I direct the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College uh, the Park Center for Independent Media strives to introduce students to media production and, and distribution outside the mainstream systems. Uh, the center also examines the impact of independent media on journalism, democracy, society, and participatory cultures. Uh, we are truly delighted to collaborate with the Office of Religion and Spiritual Life and Muslim Chaplaincy at Cornell in hosting this event. Uh, let me introduce our special guest at, uh, who's going to speak shortly. Uh, Misha Yusuf is a Pakistani American podcast host, writer, and producer on a mission to make shows that inspire awe and push audio into uncharted territory. She's the founder and CEO of Dustlight Productions, a mission driven podcast studio. In 2020, the Los Angeles Business Journal named her as one of their 20 in their 20s. Uh, this followed Ad Week naming her as the producer of the year and her podcast landing on nine best of lists in 2019. This year, Misha helped make the Michelle Obama podcast as an executive producer with her production company Dustlight in collaboration with Higher Ground Audio and Spotify. In 2019, Misha made uh, the very famous and, and um, most well-known, Tell Them I Am, 
Uh, the LA Times called that show quietly revolutionary. The New York Times called it hypnotic listening. And Time, The Atlantic, Cosmopolitan, Huffington Post, etc. many more named it as one of the best podcasts of 2019. That series, that series uh, was about the small defining moments in our lives, the voices which are all Muslim, but their stories are universal. Misha has also produced the big one, Your Survival Guide in 2019, named one of the Time, The Atlantic, Vulture, IndieWire, and NYT Podcast Club's best podcasts of the year. All this podcasting started with Beginner, her autobiographical series about learning to belong as an immigrant in America. And Misha also hosts a Quran book club on IGTV, on Insta TV, makes jokes on McSweeney's and writes hideous things for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she got her master's in journalism at Northwestern University. Misha's work is unique for its originality and a voice that is much needed in America today. Its universalism speaks to all the communities and testifies to why media are vital for social change. Uh, Misha will uh, talk about her work for a little over 30 minutes and uh, please do leave your questions and you can raise your hand later as well and we shall uh, have an opportunity to interact with her. So once again, welcome Misha and over to you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Raza for the generous introduction and thank you so much to the Park Center, Ithaca College and the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life for hosting me. Uh, thank you all for joining and listening. Um, I feel like that was a long list of bragging so thank you for being patient through that. Uh, I'm excited for all of your thoughts and questions at the end of the discussion. Um, Today, I want to talk to you about what drives me, um, specifically what drives me to make a show like Tell Them I Am or a series like the Quran Book Club. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to watch either one of those um, or if you've had a chance to watch the debate last night, but it's becoming clear every day that we live in a divided and disconnected world. There is an us and a them, no matter who you are, uh, there is someone who hates you and someone you hate, or at least strongly dislike for those of you who hate the word hate. Um, as a kid, I used to hear people say all the time that the antidote to hate is love. But as I've grown older, I've realized that that's not really possible. Uh, you can't love someone you don't know. And so often hate is born from the fear of the unknown. So maybe a more realistic way of looking at it is that the antidote to hate is vulnerability. Allowing yourself to be seen in all of your messy glory. Because people can't hate you if they see themselves in you. That desire for connection to see and be seen is what drives me as a person and as a creator. And because of my experiences with Tell Them I Am and the Quran Book Club, I'm here to make the case that we, marginalized people, should center vulnerability as a strategy to combat hate. Specifically, and I am going to speak more specifically to my Muslim brothers and sisters, but I do think this applies universally as well. But specifically, Muslims need to center vulnerability as a strategy to combat hate. In letting other Muslims and non-Muslims witness our emotional and intellectual struggles, we create an opportunity for genuine connection. Now, there are 3.45 million Muslims in the United States. Of those 3.45 million, three quarters, 75%, for those of you who can't do your math, uh, are immigrants or the children of immigrants. That means that either they were born in another country or their parents were born in another country. Now, in the, in the 1880s in America, the term new immigrants became popular and it referred to an influx of Jewish and Catholic immigrants to the United States. 
that term had undertones of fear that the new immigrant communities um, might not be able to assimilate into American culture in the way that the nativists at the time thought was appropriate. Today, that term may refer to those 75% of American Muslims who either themselves moved here or were born to someone who immigrated here. I'm one of them. Those Americans who have been here for decades, um, whose grandparents were born here, for example, let's call them old immigrants, they might not really know those of us who just showed up. And before we, the new immigrants, have had a chance to invite our neighbors over for chai or drop off mamul during Eid, before we've had a chance to go to their Sunday barbecue and have an organic discussion about drinking or not drinking, before we've had the chance to babysit their toddler and teach her some Urdu, before all of that, our neighbors have started to get to know us through the news. Things like 9-11, ISIS, and good old Al-Qaeda. And it's put us on the defensive. I mean, it's not crazy for us to be on the defensive. More than 60% of US adults say that being Muslim hurts someone's chances for advancement in American society. So instead of being in a position where we can show who we are, we've gotten stuck proving and explaining who we are not. For example, in September 2015, BuzzFeed published a video which had the premise, I'm a Muslim, but I'm not dot, 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 to try to tackle stereotypes about Muslims. That's a defensive position. And it's important to note that part of that trap of being on the defensive comes from a cultural problem within the Muslim community. I don't know what any of your moms are like, um, but mine, for those of you who've listened to the podcast probably know, mine tends to worry a lot about what people will think or even worse, what they might say. That fear of how people will perceive us within and outside our community has pushed us to project an image, often a perfect veneer, an image that is incongruent with who we actually are, an image that has little room for emotional or intellectual wrestling, little room for vulnerability. Let me tell you right now, it's impossible to connect with perfection because the truth is that none of us are perfect or ever going to be perfect. And our fear as Muslims of how we might be perceived pushes us to pretend to be perfect and that fake perfection then prevents people within and outside of our community from seeing us for who we are. It prevents people from seeing themselves in us. It prevents them from relating to us. It prevents them from loving us. In fact, here are some hopeful numbers. Our neighbors, the old immigrants, they're not as close-minded as we think. Almost 90% of non-Muslim Americans said in 2017 that they would be willing to accept Muslims as their neighbors. Almost 80% of them would accept Muslims as family members. So what do we do? Some might say that we assimilate, that we try extra hard to show how American we are, deal with the age old problem of being a new immigrant the way the nativists want us to deal with it. Maybe that's how we'll be accepted as neighbors and as family members. But I say we lean on vulnerability. We let people see who we are, our flaws, our questions, our doubts, our emotions, all of it. We let people witness our emotional and intellectual wrestling. Because as Eric Fromm says in his book, The Art of Loving, Love is possible only if two persons communicate with each other from the center of their existence. Love experienced thus is a constant challenge. It is not a resting place, but a moving, growing, working together. Whether there is harmony or conflict, joy or sadness is secondary to the fundamental fact that two people experience themselves from the essence of their existence that they are one with each other by being one with themselves rather than by fleeing from themselves. 
I think that applies to two people as much as it applies to two communities. And that's what I'm trying to do with Tell Them I Am and the Quran Book Club. To be vulnerable with who I am, to not run from myself, to let others experience me and to create a safe space for them to show who they are, to experience each other without judgment. Let's start with Tell Them I Am. The podcast is, as you heard earlier, about the small moments that define who we are and who we are not. Each episode, there's a different guest who is Muslim, but the guests don't have to talk about being Muslim or about Islam. Instead, they share all kinds of stories, revealing their truths and their struggles in a way that I'd honestly never heard before. And here is a clip of Najma Sharif talking about picking up boys at the mosque. But before we completely route her out, a message from Najma. God, my mom's going to kill me, but it's okay. Uh, Love you, mom. Okay, so first of all, she and all her friends change all the guys' names in their phones to girl names. So I never had guy names in my phone because I just didn't want, like, a text popping up and then getting in trouble for talking to, like, one of the many Mohammeds in town. Like, who had time for that? I didn't. She definitely sneaks out a handful of times. I wasn't really good about sneaking out. I mean, I did it a few times, but that was always more difficult because you never knew when you'd come back and driving and stuff and whatever. More often, though, it's just easier for her to sneak boys in. I had, like, my room in the basement, and I would just kind of, like, open my window, (laughs) and they just slip in. And here's the crazy thing. She gets away with everything. She's so good at hiding stuff and talking her way out of things that she has a near-perfect track record. Her parents even trust her. And on top of all of that, she uses the mosque as her alibi when she's actually going on late-night dates at the local lake. So she always shows up to the mosque looking really good. Wing liner, um, blush, uh, just all that to the mosque. For who? Obviously, it's not for God. So you don't have to be Muslim to relate to that. Like who hasn't looked extra cute for church or temple or youth group to impress their crush? Who hasn't tried to trick their parents so they can freely talk to their crush? But it takes a special kind of bravery within the Muslim community. Talking about our romantic experiences publicly, even the most PG of stories, especially as women, is met with, what will people say? And that question wasn't one that our guests alone had to wrestle with. It's a question that I had to wrestle with as the host of Tell Them I Am. Do I play the role of a host who just asks the questions or one who honors my guests' vulnerability with my own? But what will people say? This is a clip from an episode where that choice was pretty high stakes. I remember the first time I drank alcohol. My college best friends, Daniel and Michael, threw me a Misha Gets Drunk party. I was 18 years old. I had never had a drink before. And I was the kind of person who swore she never would. But I was in college. It was the end of my freshman year. My friends were like, Misha, just try it before you give it up. I was already becoming less religiously Muslim and way more culturally Muslim. So I gave in to peer pressure. The first drink I had was not a glass of wine or a beer. It was a shot, a dirty Girl Scout, which means peppermint schnapps. And I got drunk that night, drunk enough to throw up. I wasn't pretty. I woke up the next morning feeling so guilty because I grew up with the idea that in Islam, drinking is not allowed. It's wrong. These days, I'm legally allowed to drink, and sometimes I still do. A glass of wine at dinner with my coworkers, a cocktail at a celebration. But every time I drink, I worry. I judge myself, I feel guilty. I wake up anxious the next day, probably because alcohol does that and not because I'm stressed about God. But okay, definitely a little bit because I'm stressed about God. And I always think, if it makes me feel this way, should I just give it up? Was my religion, my culture right all along? 
And then at the next birthday party, when someone offers me a drink, I face the choice. Say no, feel good, and possibly have to explain myself. Or just say, sure. So, I say sure. I'm Misha Youssef. This is Tell Them I Am. Uh, my parents definitely had several heart attacks listening to that episode. Um, jokes aside, I do have to give my parents a lot of credit for giving me a safe space to be honest, um, to share who I am and how I live my life, not just with them, but with the world. And it is that safe base that allowed me to make the decision to share my own stories, my own emotional wrestling with my guests and my audience. Sometimes that emotional wrestling was simple and uncontroversial, like being a jealous and competitive person. And sometimes it was the stuff that Muslim aunties live to spread, like drinking or dating. And sometimes it was too scary for even me to face, like my own biases against hijabi Muslims or Indians. But I chose to share my stories and my feelings because having a platform as a new immigrant is a privilege. And though I don't represent all Muslims, as one of the few Muslim faces in the public eye, I do represent some. And to shy away from that responsibility by not sharing who I am, or worse, lying about who I am, would do my entire community a disservice. It would prevent us from being seen and loved. So at the top of every episode of Tell Them I Am, I chose to share a small story from my own life, to admit to my faults and my strengths, to laugh at myself and to question myself so that a little Muslim girl somewhere in her parents' car listening to a podcast might think, I'm worthy. So that a white Republican boy in Iowa might think, hey, we're not that different. In her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, Brene Brown says, to become fully human means growing gentler towards human weakness. It means practicing forgiveness of my and everyone else's hourly failures to live up to divine standards. It means living so that I'm only human does not become an excuse for anything. It means receiving the human condition as a blessing and not curse in all its achingly frail and redemptive reality. And that I'm only human doesn't just apply to our emotional vulnerability. It extends to our intellectual vulnerability, our human acceptance of what we don't know a humility that allows us to question, to doubt, and to discuss intellectual questions of faith without shame or fear of judgment. I would argue that intellectual vulnerability is even harder for Muslims. Most, if not all of us believe that the Quran is the perfect and complete word of God, that to doubt it is a sin. So many of us don't question it. In fact, many of us don't even read the Quran in a language that we understand. We keep our Qurans on the highest shelf in our homes. And when we pull them down, we read them in seventh century Arabic, rarely looking at a translation. We let our Imams and our Sheikhs tell us how to interpret the book and how to practice the religion. We rarely allow ourselves the privilege of understanding, questioning, or discussing the Quran with our peers. That's how it was in my home uh, for the longest time. And it wasn't until I was in high school that one Ramzan, my dad decided to pull the book from the shelf and read with me. This is when I realized just how beautiful and inclusive the Quran was, how different from what people said it said. For example, here's verse 62 from chapter two. Indeed, the believers, Jews, Christians, and Sabians Whoever truly believes in God and the last day and does good will have their reward with the Lord. There is nothing for them to fear. They will not sorrow. Now, it's common knowledge for Muslims that the first word of the Quran revealed to Muhammad was read. And still, so many of us don't read. But forget what God commanded. Let's just consider the world that we live in. The Quran is used as a weapon by fundamentalists and by those who demonize Muslims. 
versus misinterpreted and taken out of context are used as proof that Muslims are extremists, less than human, out to harm other people. And still we don't empower ourselves with the actual words of the book. Are we that afraid of intellectual vulnerability, of admitting what we don't know, what we still need to figure out? That's why I started the Quran Book Club this year on August 7th. Every Friday, I read the Quran with a guest. We do a live reading on Instagram, an accessible platform. Uh, we go line by line from the beginning to the end of the Quran. And we've only made it to chapter two, which is why most of the quotes tonight are from chapter two. We usually get through about 10 lines at a time, talking through our interpretations, our research, our questions. And you know, the craziest thing is that every guest, Muslim and non-Muslim, practicing and non-practicing, has said that they have never read the Quran in this way because they've been scared. What if they're not qualified to read and interpret the book, let alone in public? This question of whether we as lay people are qualified to read the Quran goes back to intellectual vulnerability. And the best way to address it is actually a story from the Quran itself. In chapter two, Surah Bakra, which means the cow, there's an incident that occurs between God, man, and the angels. It starts at verse 30. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Remember when your Lord said to the angels, I'm gonna place a successive human authority on earth? They asked God, will you place in it someone who will spread corruption there and shed blood while we glorify your praises and proclaim your holiness? God responded, I know what you do not know. He taught man the names of all things. Then he presented them to the angels and said, tell me the names of these if what you say is true. They replied, glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. You are truly the all-knowing, all-wise. God said, O oh man, inform them of their names. Then when man did, God said, did I not tell you that I know the secrets of the heavens and the earth and I know what you reveal and what you conceal? And remember when we said to the angels, prostrate before man, so they all did, but did not, but not Iblis who refused and acted accordingly, becoming unfaithful. Now we have a whole episode of the Quran Book Club dedicated to this little section alone. And there are a million things you can take away from this. But one of the things that stands out so clearly is that God places knowledge and agency above worship. Man knowing the names of things is more important than angels blindly worshiping God. He literally makes the angels prove that point by bowing down to man. And that hierarchy of knowledge over worship shows that the Quran itself encourages you to read, to discuss, to ask the questions, to find your way to faith. The famous Pakistani poet Iqbal writes about man's agency in the Quran. He says in his book, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, man's first act of disobedience was also his first act of free choice. And that is why, according to Quranic narration, Adam's first transgression was forgiven. Now, goodness is not a matter of compulsion. It is the self's free surrender to the moral ideal and arises out of a willing cooperation of free egos. A being whose movements are wholly determined like a machine can't produce goodness. Freedom is thus a condition of goodness. But to permit the emergence of a finite ego who has the power to choose after considering the relative values of several courses of actions open to him is really to take a great risk. For freedom to choose good involves also the freedom to choose what is the opposite of good. That God has taken this risk shows his immense faith in man. It is for man now to justify this faith. In that freedom, in that attempt to justify God's faith in man, there is struggle. Emotional struggle, but also intellectual struggle. We can't acquire knowledge, the knowledge that God shows in the Quran he values so highly without doing the work. The work of reading, the work of questioning, the work of intellectual vulnerability. There's something that Reza Aslan said in his book, No God But God. He said, by definition, all interpretations are valid. However, some interpretations are more reasonable than others. Intellectual vulnerability forces us to trust ourselves to interpret, and it makes us vulnerable to judgment, to letting others decide whether our interpretation is reasonable. 
maybe it's that fear of being shamed by those around us, of being seen as unreasonable that has kept us from being intellectually vulnerable. Whatever it is that has put us in this position, it's also prevented us from connecting with each other. Every episode of Quran Book Club, the guests have come away saying how much fun they have had talking about the Quran and their reflections in this way. One of the guests hadn't cracked open a Quran since the 90s. He's the one with whom I um, read that little section about the angels. And in reading that section together, we both discovered things we didn't know before, ways of seeing the text that allowed us to discuss our personal stories and our own struggles. And reading it together fo forced us both to look to each other to figure out what interpretations made sense and what didn't. Neither one of us was on a pedestal higher than the other. From these experiences, I can't help but feel that intellectual vulnerability, just like emotional vulnerability, will help us connect with those unlike us, maybe even those who don't know us and are scared of us. Because who knows all the answers? Who can relate to never questioning, never doubting, other than God, obviously? Rilke said, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Given the divided world we live in, given just how surprising this year alone has been, I think we have no choice but to live with the questions. To be not only emotionally, but also intellectually vulnerable. Because our questions might be one of our only portals to true human connection. To getting to know each other. And if we're lucky, to loving each other. I'm gonna leave you with one last little thing. There is a Pink Floyd song, Us and Them. Some of you might've heard it. There's a lyric in that song that reminds me of how to bridge that gap between us and them. It goes, and after all, we're only ordinary men, me and you, 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 you. We can bridge the gap between us and them by remembering that we are ordinary, that we are messy, questioning creatures, that none of us are on a pedestal next to the other. That at the end of the day, being vulnerable with each other shouldn't be as scary as it has become because we're all we've got, me and you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Misha. That was uh, truly wonderful and profound uh, as well. And of course, those who are familiar with your podcasts and your work, uh, where you, many of the themes you picked were, would resonate with them. But I'm so glad that you, uh, you've talked about vulnerability, which is what many communities are facing uh, in 2020, especially, and, and in the last few years that has increased. So I have many questions, but I'm going to hold off and uh, let all the participants, uh, those who want to, uh, ask you questions about your work and what you said. So please uh, make your uh, raise your hand on um, on Zoom, and uh, we shall uh, get to you. And uh, may I just remind, keep your try and keep the questions brief. And uh, if you have a comment, also please make it as brief as you can, uh, so that we get to hear Misha more uh, in this part of our session. Uh, okay, so, right. So um, I'll, I'll start with a question, uh, Misha, you, you seem to have engaged with Iqbal's work, with Rilke's poetry, you know, all these different streams of East and the West as, they, as they're called. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't like these, uh, these boxing of, uh, of uh, but anyway, we, we use it all the time. So, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in Iqbal's lectures on the reconstruction of Islamic thought, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you also may have come across the, uh, both the uh, idea of uh, uh, reinterpreting and renewing our, uh, you know, Islamic faith and, up, uh, and kind of uh, modernizing the interpretations. Of course, you know, the holy scriptures, we all Muslims believe are, are divine and final. Uh, and uh, so have you, do you plan to take that up in, uh, at some point in the future? 
Um, I, I think that would be a gargantuan task. Um, you know, I, I do, I absolutely adore the Quran. I, I've always had a very, very special relationship with the book. And I think that at least presently, my, you know, most urgent task feels like the Quran book club and making my way through um, the Quran, the English translations of the Quran that are available to me and my guests. Um, one week at a time from beginning to end and just being really honest about what we're discovering and kind of throwing different interpretations out there. Um, I will not rule it out to do a translation or interpretation at some point. Um, it is something I've thought about, but I think that it would require a period of study that I haven't actually undergone yet. And I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, as comfortable as I feel with like doing an Instagram series, right? Or um, talking about the Quran as a lay person in that type of setting. If I were to actually do a translation or an interpretation, I think that that would really require some scholarly um, dedication. And, and I, I couldn't allow myself to do it without that. Of course, of course, no, no, well, well put. And uh, so I'm uh, checking if there's a hand somewhere raised okay well that allows me to ask my next question so you know i i know your work is so highly acclaimed and widely followed uh but what kind of responses from non-muslims have struck you for uh, their engagement or their uniqueness i mean i one would like to know that as well because i mean podcasting is also uh i mean it's a very at the end of the day it is a very interactive experience yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of people who have reached out um, and there's been kind of a spectrum. So there have been people who have reached out who are, you know, friends with Muslims, who um, have Muslims as their neighbors, some who, you know, are married into Muslim families or are in interracial, interfaith relationships with Muslims. And I think those people who are familiar with Muslims have reached out and said, um, how it made them feel seen and allowed for them to share something with their family members or other friends who were non-Muslim and maybe had certain biases or walls erected against Muslims to actually have a tangible example. Um, because it takes a long time to actually get to know someone and tell them I am kind of, you know, cut through some of that. Um, I think the place where responses from people who are non-Muslim, who are not familiar with Muslims, um, ha, you know, where I've been struck by the responses is, is Quran Book Club. Um, I think one, I've been surprised by how few people have read the book, Muslim and non-Muslim, and how much they actually um, have enjoyed the process of reading it and discovering new truths um, that we have never been exposed to, you know, as a society, as a Western society, but also within the Muslim community. Um, so I think that's that's what has like really, really given me a lot of inspiration and the strength to keep going and really surprised me. I never expected people to be excited about. I, I honestly thought Tell Them I Am would garner a lot more attention and excitement than the Quran Book Club. I thought that was like an academic sort of experiment, <laughs> you okay. know. So there's a there's been a question which has been submitted, and it's kind of linked to the uh, what you earlier mentioned about the Quran Book Club, uh, and it says I was wondering if Misha has any tips to as to how to demystify the idea of studying the Quran for her book group when sometimes it seems like taking that first step into study is the hardest part? I think it's just actually realizing that the Quran urges you to read it and that it's okay to not figure it out, you know, in the first try. I mean, I think this is my fourth or fifth time reading the Quran and several different translations. And honestly, I'm discovering brand new things. And there are things that I don't think I understood at all. And it's lived experience that has allowed me to see them in a new light. And so I think the expectation that you'll figure it all out or that all of your interpretations will be valid um, or that you know all of it must be read in like one sitting, it's not, it's not a novel, like it's such a um, practice, you know, and seeing it as that practice, the way that you might do yoga a few times a week, maybe you pull out the Quran a few times a week, and you read a couple of lines and really engage with those couple of lines. And maybe in your entire lifetime, you will have made, made your way through the book and really, really gotten to know some portions that are meaningful to you and inspire you to live a more conscientious life. Mm. 
So yeah, so uh, that's great. Another question that we have for you, Misha, is that uh, do you have any advice uh, for um, uh, on how a college student, how as a college student one could practice vulnerability? Also, it feels like there is a lot of pressure to not explore questions of spirituality and religion in college because one is assumed to be an extremist. So, you know, it links to what you said at, right at the start of your talk. So it's an interesting question. I mean, I'd, uh, I'd also like to know because many students have this, uh, this question generally when, when we talk about spirituality. I mean, I can't pretend to know the answer um, of like what the best way to do it would be. I think it so much of it depends on like where you are geographically, right? Like what country you're in and like what state you're in and who surrounds you and what kind of attitudes surround you. And I, I won't pretend that like vulnerability alone is the answer. There are a lot of places where there's, you know, pervasive hate and there are hate crimes and people will um, get agitated if you have a beard or if you dress a certain way or if you pray in public. Um, so, you know, I think that you have to do what you have to do to be safe. Um, that said, I think in my experience, um, when I was in college, I was wrestling with questions of faith. I, I studied philosophy in undergrad. I was reading the Quran cover to cover, you know, trying to figure out like what I believed. I had a brief stint as an atheist. So I was like, screw all of this. I don't believe in any of it. Um, and I think in all of that, the thing that really helped me was just having conversations, just being honest about where I was and what I was thinking, um, frankly, with my family, with my community of Muslims, but also with my classmates within, you know, um, the philosophy major with people who I was engaging with just as friends, um, at like five in the morning in the laundry room, we'd be sitting there talking about God and, you know, how to live a good life. And I, and I know many of us do that in college, but I think it's actually the perfect time for that kind of spiritual reckoning because we have so much time and so many emotions. Um, so I think there's actually a lot more patience and room for that. And people that it, this does go back to that idea of vulnerability, right? I think people do appreciate having those conversations because most of us are wrestling with those questions at that age in our, in our teenages in our early college years. Yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting once again. So uh, another question uh, that has come your way, Misha, can you share more about what your family thinks about uh, your podcasts? <laughs> I was going to ask you that as well, but anyway, good that somebody asked that. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, they're a huge fan. <laughs> I would say my mom and dad are probably have slightly different opinions. Um, I, I will admit my mom didn't love the Najma Sharif episode and that's like a very PG episode. Um, you know, and then we, we as a family watched Rami together and my dad kept saying to my mom, like, look, what Misha's doing is not even that crazy. <laughs> like, look at this. And um, so I think, you know, my mom is somebody who is more traditionally um, devout. She does try to pray several times a day. Um, she doesn't cover her head or anything, but she does <laughs> read surahs and is constantly blowing them on us as we're coming in and out of the house. Um, and my dad, I would say, is probably the person who's really inspired me to think of faith and religion and spirituality and Islam specifically in kind of more avant-garde ways and really um, interpret and understand it in a way that makes intuitive sense to me. Um, so it, it is that tension, I think, that has pulled me back to religion over and over again. And um, with Tell Them I Am, I think sometimes reluctantly, they are proud and they're a fan. And then with Quran Book Club, my mom actually doesn't watch Quran Book Club, but my dad watches every episode and engages in the comments, um, as some of you might have noticed, whoever has watched. But um, that's, yeah, it's, you know, it's like, it's a constant battle, but I feel like they still have provided a safe enough space for me where I don't feel scared. I, I feel loved nonetheless. Lovely. That's so wonderful to hear. Uh, I uh, just wanted to, be, uh, you know, extend that question, you know, because you talked about Najma and late night dating and, you know, the shot that you, uh, you know, mentioned in your, in that clip we heard. So how's the Desi community that, you know, and, and for the audience, Desis are South Asians in, you know, abroad, particularly, they have a peculiar, unique subculture. So how have they responded to these, uh, these very interesting and sometimes bold, uh, you know, confessions or uh, 
discussions in your podcasting? You know, it's so crazy because I expected people to fully like come at me with the hate mail and like the one star reviews on Apple and Spotify. Um, and I think I have had a couple of those, um, you know, people have mostly on Instagram, like people have been like, oh, you can't have a tattoo. Like you're not Muslim if you have one or you can't have like something from the Quran tattooed on you. Um, so I've had those kinds of reactions, but there's so few and far between that I've actually been shocked. Like I, and, and the Desi community, I don't know if they're scared <laughs> of saying things to my face, but I have not had anybody come to me and say anything but positive things. In fact, um, there's a friend of my parents who, you know, specifically pulled me aside and was like, I am just so thankful that you have, have done this and spoken openly about this because I feel like with my daughters, I was kind of living this life in private and not able to discuss with my friends like how I was raising them. Um, so hearing that from my parents' contemporaries has been really validating. Uh, you know, I, there are some side glances at, at functions. Um, good thing we're in quarantine because I, <laughs> I don't have to deal with anybody anymore. <laughs> but um, there are there are some people who look down upon me and what I'm doing. And, and um, you know, as, as God says in the Quran, the disbelievers will always be the disbelievers. So yes, yes. Each is out. <laughs> Great. So we, we have two more questions for you. The first one is from Ben Kibbe at IC. Uh, who's asking, as a Muslim, do you feel like you have to explain and defend your faith on a regular basis? How do you deal with having to bear that burden and respond to questions that feel antagonistic? Yes, I do. I do feel like I have to defend um, my faith on a regular basis. And, um, you know, what I was talking about earlier tonight, like one of my philosophies really is to flood with the affirmative rather than um, like I, I really believe in affirmation and celebration rather than existing in like protest or in negative and trying to prove what what I am not and what my faith is not. Um, but the society that we live in really doesn't create a lot of space for that. And um, you know, it's it is a burden. But I would rather that I am one of the people who is taking that upon me and then has the privilege to turn it around and really show who I am and what my faith is about. Um, rather than always responding to the direct accusations or questions that are presented. Um, and in fact, I feel like I'm not like an event evangelist, but I do feel like I've gotten to the point where I'm very proactively, again, talking about these things um, so that even before those questions are asked or those assumptions are made or I'm put on the defensive, um, I've already kind of come at them <laughs> with like, oh, look at this cool thing that I discovered, you know, like no friend is is um, off limits in terms of like, oh, look what I read in the Quran, even if they think it's boring or annoying, um, yeah. they have to hear it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, okay, we have more questions for you. So one is, uh, and it's a very, it's a question from Muhammad Salman Khan. Uh, he's saying, well, I love all the great work you're doing, Misha. But some, for some of us, it has been difficult to be queer and ex-Muslim within the conservative Muslim communities. Uh, Salman Khan uh, says, I'm a queer journalist and activist uh, fleeing uh, the homophobic laws of Pakistan. And how within your work and uh, you're able to be welcoming and inclusive towards oppressed identities within the Muslim community? Woo, that's a long and tough question. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry about all of, you know, the, the negative, um, feedback that you've received and the way that people have treated you. Um, I think that's completely unjustified and, um, for lack of a better word, pardon my language, fucked up. Um, you know, I, again, like I cannot represent all Muslims. I do not identify as queer. Um, but two of my best friends are. Um, and, you know, our EP for the first season of Tell Them I Am, Arwen Nix, um, is a gay woman. She's married to a woman um, and she's not Muslim, but she is gay. And um, having her be a part of my life and be a part of the show really informed a lot of the decisions that we made when it came to the show. Um, and actually on, on my dad's encouragement, something that was really, really important to me with Tell Them I Am season one is to highlight um, several queer voices. And you know, there's a reason that we started with Tan France as episode one. Um, that's 
not a choice that a lot of other people would have made. Um, no shade to Rami, but it took Rami until season two to show that perspective. And we led with that. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the first step. Um, I'm also aware of the Uyghur genocide and the Muslims who are persecuted all throughout the world. And that's something that, you know, is really, really front of mind for me for season two, um, to highlight Uyghur voices, to continue highlighting queer voices, trans voices, um, and to, you know, um, also represent Black Muslims who I think often get the short end of the stick and, and aren't represented as clearly and as frequently in the media, even though they're some of the oldest Muslims in the West and um, some of the most populous, you know? So I am mindful of it. I am not perfect. And um, I, I'm just so sorry that you, you deal with what you deal with. Right, that, thank you. And I'll move on to the next question. So, which is, have you found useful conversation partners in either Muslim history or in other traditions like the Jewish uh, mid, mid, Midrash? Uh-oh, it just told me to unmute myself. Um, you know, I haven't studied Jewish tradition that much, but I, my um, most recent partner who, with whom I um, was in a relationship for four years, my, probably my most serious partner um, was Jewish. And so I became pretty deeply aware of Jewish tradition and um, philosophy. And also as a philosophy major, I studied Spinoza with a lot of love and admiration and, and was really, really excited about um, Spinoza's philosophy. And so I think that that's probably the most comparable or um, I don't know what the right word for it is, but like the most inspiring um, experience I've had. I have also spent some time studying Buddhist texts, which is not, you know, Abrahamic at all. Um, but I spent some time in a Buddhist meditation retreat doing uh, Vipassana meditation and read Alan Watts's interpretation um, of, you know, Taoism and uh, Chinese Buddhism. And a lot of that has actually really informed my interpretation of Islam and my understanding of Islam. Um, but I don't, I don't have like conversation partners as in like contemporaries and other traditions because I'm not really a scholar, you know, I'm just, just a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say a normal person. You're quite extraordinary in many ways, Misha, but we'll come to that later. So, and the, uh, because I have to read another question for you, how do you navigate uh, the imposter syndrome? Have you ever struggled with it? Yes, because I am human. <laughs> um, I think we all struggle with it. I don't struggle with it as much anymore. Um, I will credit uh, like a life-threatening car accident. I was a pedestrian, was run over by a car last year on September 11th. That's a story I have repeated many times at this point, but um, I will say that uh, having that experience really, really rid me of a lot of my fears and, um, and I hope inshallah for a long, long time, if not forever. Um, but I, I just, I'm not scared, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? Like people will think I'm a liar. People won't believe me. Someone will try to kill me. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> we will all meet our end someday. So, um, might as well do it while speaking the truth. Yeah. That's quite a statement. So, uh, but I just, I just want to also, you know, explore, you know, following up uh, on uh, the earlier questions. But I think I'll come to that because Yasin Ahmed from our chaplain at Cornell has a question: Is there a message uh, or a passage that struck you which you'd like to share with us before we let you go? From the Quran? Yeah. I said, no. Any in general. I mean, I feel like I shared some of the ones in general. There is something for the Quran that I want to share, but it's, um, you know what? I'm going to turn off my video for one second and go grab it, and then I'll read it to you guys. So we just have a, a few minutes left. If you have other questions or you want to ask anything related to Misha's work, her life, her engagement. This, this is your last few minutes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I've been doing a deep dive in Bukhara, so this is where it comes from again. 
There's, I mean, I love you, Sura Yasin. Not to, not to play a pun on your name, Yasin. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, but th this verse, it just struck me in a whole other way. And make of it whatever you will. Um, and again, like if you're not Muslim, you know, just appreciate the beauty of the the poetry and the the rhythm and the writing of the Quran um, and the message. It doesn't have to be religious. But um, verse two seventy four goes. Even then, you're well. Maybe I should read a little before. Um, actually, no, it wouldn't make, it wouldn't make any sense. So verse 274 goes, even then your hearts become hardened like a rock or even harder for some rocks gush rivers, others split spilling water while others are humbled in awe of God. And God is never unaware of what you do. And I think that's just so beautiful because it reminds you that no matter how much life hardens you. Um, that many of us, even when we are those cynical rocks, that we do split and water gushes out and we are still capable of love and vulnerability um, and, and deep, deep emotion and intuitive and spiritual understanding. So um, that's, that's what I would share. <laughs> yes, right. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful verse indeed. And uh, you know, so so I will. I'll go back to my own question. I mean, I I mean, it's more. It's it's a comment come question, uh, which is you, you know. Uh, so you work also traverses this whole notion of identity, mm -hmm. you know, the identity of an immigrant, the identity of, of a Muslim, of an American, of a woman, and uh, you know. So and and I'm sure you're not the. I mean, you know, we all are navigating uh, these uh, multiple identities every day at at work at. If you go to grocery store as well, people are stop you and ask you where, where are you from. So I mean, you know, what is uh, uh, for for some? Uh, I think for some of the students who are uh, part of this, uh, you know, session. I mean, what would you say uh, is the best way to to handle uh, these uh, these challenges or and uh, you know the the burden of this this identification? That's an ongoing constant process in a country which is predominantly uh, still controlled by white structures and white power? I think that's a really, really important and, and well put question, Raza, thank you. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know, you know, um, I think we just all have to do the best we can. Uh, therapy has helped me a lot. And I know in college, everybody gets some free therapy. So fully take advantage of it. Um, because I think the trauma of being an other in Western society as part of the diaspora, whether that's, you know, whatever community, it doesn't have to be a religious community. I, that trauma is real and it lives in our bodies and it lives in our, you know, interactions with others. So I think processing that with whatever resources are available to you is important. Um, and I guess the other thing I will say is creating, making art, whatever that may be for you. Your art could be being an engineer or being a doctor and how you interact with your patients or how you construct, you know, something within our infrastructure. I don't know enough about engineering. Um, it, it doesn't have to be limited to what is traditionally considered creative work. Um, but I think that is a place for both healing and for transcending whatever identities you feel limited by. Um, because I, I don't know if it's that easy to do in the day to day, you know, in the grocery store and the Uber ride or whatever. Yeah. Th th thank you. Healing, creativity, great messages. And I'll hand it back to our dear friend, uh, Harold, um, uh, who's our host as well, our, uh, the, the, the real mover and shaker of this event. So back to you. Thank you, Raza. A deep, deep appreciation for your guidance during this conversation. Misha, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope this is not the last time that we are in dialogue with one another. Um, and to all that joined us this evening, thank you as well. And I'm really, I'm taking really, to, to heart, um, to being ordinary. And I think that's so important, particularly in this time where COVID and our pandemic experiences at some times maybe create voices in our head around whether or not we're good enough. And so thank you for that word, Misha. Um, for folks, uh, we are, con I think this is a really fascinating way to start some conversations that we're having at IC. And in a few weeks, Valerie Kaur is going to be with us talking about 
her book, um, See No Stranger, Revolutionary Love, um, her memoir and manifesto, which I think follows, I think Misha, you've opened up the conversation in a really great way. And so if you wanna join us, um, we'll put in the chat box, a link to that event for you to register and just wanted to plug that in. But Misha, thank you. I don't know if you have any final, final remarks for us this evening before we end our time together. I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for your questions and Raza for moderating. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Valerie's. So um, I can't wait to tune in to the next event. Great. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Thanks so much, everybody.